thank you very much, Rajit. It's a great pleasure to be part of this. And that was an absolutely fascinating discussion just now that we heard, uh, which I'm very grateful to have uh, to follow on from because uh, I'm going to pick up some of the points that were already made uh, so brilliantly and effectively by um, Shatajit and Prabir and Indranil. I, so, because I'm uh, venturing into areas, as uh, Shurajit pointed out, that are not necessarily the economist domain, some of them. But let me just, I, I want to just show you a couple of slides as well, just to give you a sense of the, um, the point about, uh, okay, let me, okay, yes. So I just want to begin by pointing out that where you live in the world actually matters, okay? Um, and why? Because this is a peculiar virus, okay? Um, it's a virus that has actually uh, disproportionately affected Europe and the USA, unlike all the other recent viruses, you know, H1N1, SARS, SARS MERS, Ebola, which fundamentally affected the developing world or East Asia. This is one where the morbidity and mortality rates are much, much higher in the developed world, particularly North America and Europe, North Europe. So I think that's a defining feature because this is what has determined the scale of the policy responses across the world in both advanced and developing countries. It's true the virus originated in Wuhan, China. It's true that they brought in a policy of containment, but this was a policy that was adapted uh, across the world without regard to the context. And I think some of those issues were already raised by Shortajit in his discussion that, you know, you are living in extremely, you're, or you're dealing with populations who live already in extremely congested circumstances, who uh, are not able to do the physical distancing. I think the term social distancing is disgusting. It's basically cast, but they're not able to do the physical distancing that is mandated for the containment and where a huge part of your workforce is informal, where you know you cannot simply say, well, stop everything and uh, we, you can uh, manage without any source of livelihood for whatever time it takes. This is a response that is possible in developed countries because they have much more extensive social protection systems, because they have much greater formality. Developing countries, 70% on average are informal, and in developed countries, it's more like 25%. So there's a very large difference in terms of the ways in which they could implement certain policies. Nonetheless, the lockdown became the global containment policy. And the other aspect of this, this fact of you know, the geographical concentration of the extreme impact of this virus in the North has been the speed and urgency of the global response. This is, this is really taking up from the points that Shotajit and Prabir have already made. We have had the most rapid vaccine development in history. And there are still no vaccines for a whole range of other disease viruses that affect people. Uh, the Ebola vaccine, which uh, Shotajit just mentioned, took six years to develop. So the rapidity of the global response, which I'm sure was done with all the appropriate protocols and they have all been recognized to be safe, was in no small measure due to the pressure created by Northern governments uh, because they hastened the, the testing procedures, they enabled much greater testing, they were willing to go with smaller numbers in terms of the results, and they granted approval very, very quickly. Uh, uh, the economist S. Subramaniam from Chennai has uh, made the point that, you know, some viruses are clearly more equal than others, and, and this is clearly a case of that. But as a result of that, we've had the, the whole issue, all the issues that were mentioned, you know, vaccine nationalism, grabs, hoarding, and so on. I will come back to that in a minute. And we've had very, very different fiscal responses in advanced and developing countries. Although the broad containment strategy has been similar, although more aggressive in some countries. Um, the point is that we not only have greater informality in the developing world, but we also have less social protection. And India is the extreme example of this. And that's my basic point. We have had the most severe containment policies, which are not suited to local conditions, and we haven't provided the same kinds of protection. Uh, just just to point out about the fiscal expanses. Now, this was at the end of December 2020 that developed 
developed countries on average were already spending an additional 22.6% of GDP in fiscal support. The other support, the central bank support in the United States alone comes to 40-50%. If you look at the latest uh, Biden support program and you add that, we are talking about 26% of GDP. Uh, in terms of just the pandemic response, the fiscal additional spending in pandemic response. The emerging markets on average, as you will see, that includes India, is only 6.2%, and the lowest, the least income countries are at 2.4%. And we are even spending less on average than we had spent after the global financial crisis, which tells you something, uh, that's the right-hand chart, which tells you something about how a, it's a much bigger crisis. There's a much greater collapse in, in incomes, and yet developing countries are spending significantly less than they did before. A lot of that is because some countries have external debt concerns already, uh, but a lot of it is simply the fear of capital flight. This is explicit in the case of India. They, they declare that the reason that they're not doing this is because it will lower our standing with credit rating agencies. And indeed, some of the credit rating agencies have already made noises about large fiscal deficits. This, I'm sure you would have already heard from Professor Patnaik and others that this is not just counterproductive, but it's macroeconomically stupid because it is adding to the economic decline in the country. And I know that Chandra will have more to say about that. So I'm not going to talk about that. The other point is that, you know, the Indian lockdown we are unusual. It was the most extreme and brutal in the world. So this is a, a chart from the ILO, which is plotting informality on the uh, y-axis with the degree of stringency of the lockdown. And I, I, everybody knows that India, we got 100% in terms of stringency, right? In the early days, the first national lockdown. And of course, we have the largest proportion of informality. 95% of our workers are informal, actually, without legal or social protection. But what is also unusual, what makes us unique in not a good way, is that we imposed this across the entire country, when in fact most regions had not been affected. At the time of the lockdown, there were only 600 cases in the country, concentrated in four states and in you know, three major metros, and yet we imposed it across the country. And uh, this is unlike China, for example, which imposed a lockdown in Wuhan and stopped internal transport between Wuhan and other provinces, but did not do this across the country. And thereafter uh, imposed restrictions on mobility and other constraints only in areas that were defined as hotspots periodically. So we did this in, for the entire country without notice. No intimation was given even to state governments who were supposed to implement it. We stopped all public transport. I, I mean, I, I needn't talk about the implications. All, all of you know much better than I do. But also it was so badly implemented that there was deep confusion about what constitutes essential goods and services. And many crucial public services were stopped. Uh, Indranil has already told, to, told you about health services, but you know, Anganwadis were closed. Uh, Midday meal systems were closed. We were denying nutrition in a country that has one of the worst nutrition indicators in the world. And of course we destroyed livelihoods. I'm sure there will be a lot more discussion about that. I don't need to dwell on this any further. What is striking is that we provided among the least social protection in the world. The ILO, which has been monitoring this, finds that India is the worst among the G20 countries and that we're in the bottom 10 or 11 countries in the world in terms of the kinds of additional social protection we offered. Uh, many, many low-income countries did much better than us. So a much smaller share of GDP, what did we do? Essentially, we provided a little bit more free food only to those already covered under the NFSA. We provided a little bit of free food for a few months to supposedly migrant workers, which was very badly implemented and not sufficiently provided even to the claimed numbers. And we provided tiny, tiny amounts of cash transfers to a very defined group of women Jantan holders and so on. The other kinds of things, you know, the social security or health insurance and so on offered to health workers, the ILO does not even consider these part of social protection because these are considered as the normal things government should be doing. What is more striking, and I'm sure this has come up already and will come up over and over again, is that India and Mexico are the only two countries that practiced fiscal austerity during the pandemic. 
that cut down in real terms on public spending over the worst nine months of the pandemic. In Mexico, at least they transferred some of their spending towards social protection. So yes, overall, their fiscal stance was contractionary. It was a bad thing. But at least they transferred some of their fiscal spending towards greater social protection. In India, we did not do that. And of course, something that I'm sure Isaac will talk about later today, the state governments were also deprived of funds. The state governments who are responsible for meeting the essential human rights of the citizens were not just deprived of funds, they were deprived of their dues from the central government in terms of GST compensation, which they had been pending for more than a year. So all in all, the government's response has been actually unbelievable. Uh, I'm, I'm currently not in India, and anyone I talk to about the Indian government response simply cannot believe it. They, they say it can't happen in a democracy. OK, I just want to go back to this question of the vaccine grab, but once more situated in the global context because uh, it's a very important point, And I, I think Satyajit and Prabhu have already covered all the important things, but I just want to give you a little graphic to give you a sense of that idea. This is the extent of vaccination on the left-hand side, uh, the doses administered by the 21st of March. And as you can see, a few countries have done rather well for themselves by grabbing the vaccines and by appropriating the available doses. Uh, many parts of the world have not had any dose at all, and a lot, most of them have uh, managed to vaccinate less than 10% of their population. Now, this is an artificial scarcity, as has already been mentioned, but even this artificial scarcity is extraordinary because uh, the developed countries have gone crazy in terms of demanding vaccine doses. They have demanded several multiples of their population. The United States, four times their population, Canada, 11 times their population. It's proudly announced on the, own, on the Canadian government website. Uh, the uh, you know, European Union, about three times their population, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, they have claimed that they will subsequently give the extra doses to people uh, in other countries deserving and so on. Uh, President Biden has announced that they will transfer extra doses to the NAFTA countries, to Canada and Mexico. Uh, why Canada needs it when it's already booked 11 times the GDP, we don't know, but anyway. This grab has effectively meant that countries that are trying to buy vaccines for their own population are at the bottom of the queue and cannot even make the, I mean, they can make orders for 2023 at this point, okay? Uh, this need not have happened, COVAX, uh, a facility set up by WHO, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and uh, an ep epidemiological preparedness initiative. This was specifically set up to avoid that. COVAX is an international facility that is supposed to buy, uh, encourage the production and then buy vaccines and distribute them. Uh, according to a very just scheme, 3% of the population first, then the next 20% and then everybody. And the whole purpose of this is to make sure you don't get that kind of vaccine grab. Unfortunately, COVAX did not prohibit side deals by governments with individual pharma companies. And that's precisely what happened. Gov these rich country governments have, that I have already talked about basically did side deals. The pricing is opaque. The price of vaccines varies anywhere between two and a half dollars to $44 per dose. We don't really know who is paying how much. COVAX itself has not been transparent about the prices that it's paying, but it's way back in the queue. We can see that. COVAX is not even able to access or the vaccines that it has promised. And it's underfunded in any case. It wanted about 6.8 billion, it's got 4 billion. To adequately meet its targets, it would need about four times that amount. Uh, it's an artificial scarcity, why? Because in fact, the production facilities across the world exist for the making of these vaccines. Uh, but there is patent protection, of course, has been mentioned, IPR protection in general. And developed countries have been repeatedly blocking efforts led by India and South Africa, but supported by everybody in the developing world. This is the uh, chart on the right, the map on the right, which is uh, the red crosses are the hall of shame of the countries that are opposing the waiving of intellectual property rights on all vaccines and related treatments. That is to say, including the testing, the masks, the PPP, uh, the other required uh, things. Uh, during the period of the pandemic, uh, which is 
exists in the WTO provisions, which exists in the TRIPS and public health provisions. Uh, nonetheless, it's being repeatedly blocked. It is uh, a major way in which companies are allowed to basically make massive hay while the sun shines, even though all of these vaccines were almost entirely developed with public funds. The um, Pfizer makes a big case in the US that they haven't taken any US federal money, but they basically got the technology from BioNTech, which got money from the German government. Moderna got two billion from the US government. Johnson and Johnson got two and a half billion from the US government and so on and so forth. The US has paid uh, 12 billion to six companies alone and an estimated 6 billion uh, to all the companies for vaccine development. And uh, in the EU as well, there's a very, I, I don't know the exact number, but basically all of these are vaccines developed with public money. The case of AstraZeneca is particularly uh, note, worth noting because this is a, a vaccine developed entirely in an Oxford lab with public money, with Oxford's public university money devoted to this particular development. And the purpose and the intention, the declared intention of the Oxford lab was to make this a commonly available technology open access. They were planning to just publish the entire technology and everything to do with it and make it available to everyone in the world. Bill Gates, who is a major funder, he gave, I think, 750 million, or no, 475 million to Oxford University, uh, stepped in and persuaded the Oxford University to go for a special individual deal with AstraZeneca, whereby AstraZeneca then declared that it was not going to make profits during the pandemic, uh, didn't define how long that was, it didn't define what making profits is, and as a result we find AstraZeneca selling at different rates to different countries, charging more to South Africa than they do to the European Union, for example. Uh, but this was something that need not have happened. This was technology that could have been made available and was intended as late as July, October, uh, sorry, it, the, the change happened in July, yes. Until July, it was intended to be publicly accessible data and information and technology. So these are things which are uh, the conflicts of interest involved in this, we don't know, but it's very clearly the case that there are concerns about how a certain, you know, public knowledge can be transferred into private hands in this particular way. CTAP is another facility that WHO set up, the COVID-19 technology access pool. And this is precisely designed to get around the other problem that uh, Probeer and uh, um, Shatajit mentioned, which is to make available the technologies. And the idea is that companies should share their technologies to enable the production of this in this pandemic emergency. 48 countries have joined, all developing countries. No company has joined. And yet, the rich country governments could very easily persuade these companies to join if they wanted to. The Biden government has just forced uh, um, Johnson & Johnson to share its technology with Merck because they want more production of the J&J vaccine within the US. So if they can do that for Merck, they could do that for CTAP. They have chosen not to. These are all companies that have already made normal profits and probably much more than normal profits. Pfizer anticipates 14 billion profits this year uh, from this vaccine. And therefore, there's absolutely no reason to prevent this. There's another small difference I just want to highlight. I, I realize I'm running out of time. The, uh, the WHO itself, there are ways in which it functions, which also prevent the greater circulation of vaccines produced elsewhere. The WHO regulatory approval is a fairly prolonged process unless you happen to be part of a special group of regulatory authorities whom the WHO uh, believes are safe. No surprises, those regulatory authorities are all in the US, Canada, North, uh, Northern Europe, and Australia. Every other country's regulatory authorities have to go through a very, very complicated process that takes months to get WHO approval for their vaccines. So while the Sputnik V vaccine developed in Russia and the Sinopharm and Sinovac um, vaccines developed in China applied for WHO approval before Moderna and Pfizer, they have still not got it. 
Moderna and Pfizer got it in late uh, no November. They are still waiting in late March for the WHO regulatory approval. It is true that some countries are going ahead anyway, but in a situation where there is, as, uh, as a, has been mentioned, there's a grab for market share, uh, all of these are very, very significant. There's a Cuban vaccine, which is apparently also uh, giving very promising results. Chances of it getting WHO regulatory approval are at the moment very low and very delayed. Okay, I just wanted to mention all of these uh, because I think it's important to recognize the broader context in which the Indian vaccine development has taken place. It's worth noting that we are very much part of that, shall we say, you know, corporate uh, rich country government nexus, which is trying to promote vaccine development of a particular type. And uh, the idea that we are using this for our own uh, soft power, I think it's a bit laughable. We are really playing into the hands of a different kind of global agenda geopolitically. Uh, I'll stop there. I just want to emphasize that, you know, the vaccines are one part of the broader step towards recovery from COVID-19. All the other elements of what would be required for a broad-based economic and social recovery at the moment are missing in India. And I think that is the real concern that we have to have one year after the lockdown was announced, that we are in a significantly worse economic and social uh, situation. And that at the moment, there appear to be no national government